Hi, this is Narsinga. Today we're going to talk about skin and the assessment and management of skin related conditions. The skin is the largest organ of the body. There are three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue also referred to as the hypodermis. The epidermis primarily pr provides protection. So it kind of separates the external world from the internal world. It is what we refer to as your primary defense mechanism. As long as you have intact skin, you are well defended from many external organisms. The dermis, which is the layer underneath, provides strength, support, blood, and nutrients to the epidermis. And then the subcutaneous tissue helps to anchor the dermis and provides insulation and further protection. So these three layers together help maintain kind of the inside world from the outside world, as well as maintaining heat and protection. So overall, your skin participates in or is responsible for homeostasis, so regulation of water and electrolyte loss, temperature regulation, through sweat and cutaneous vasculature and sensation. Skin is also responsible for vitamin synthesis. So the photoconversion of um, 7-dehydrocholesterol to active vitamin D. So, and that's why it's important for you to get your 20 minutes of sunshine every day. And then psychosocially, your skin contributes to body image. So if your skin has you know, a lot of blemishes or lesions that could contribute to a problem with your self-image. Your skin assessment should include the color, temperature, condition, which is moisture, and turgor of the skin. Assess the skin color overall. Normal skin is warm toned regardless of the amount of pigment that it has. It should be dry and warm to the touch and elastic. So good recoil or good turgor. Be alert for pallor, jaundice, erythema, and cyanosis. In patients with darker pigmented skin, remember to observe the oral mucosa and the palate, the conjunctiva, so the sclera, the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and the nail beds for color changes. Use the back of your hand to feel the temperature of the skin, like their forehead, um, and compare areas of concern to their general skin temperature. If you have a spot that you think might be infected, feel if that's warmer than a place, you know, some other place on the body. Compare extremity temperature left and right. So you want to know if somebody has unilateral temperature changes. Cool skin may indicate a lack of perfusion or just exposure. And hot skin may indicate a fever or inflammatory process or exposure to like heat or direct sunlight. Assess the skin moisture and turgor. Is it dry and flaky with tenting turgor? or dry without sweating, but supple and normal turgor. Is the patient diaphoretic or is there edema? Note that the mucous membranes provide a good assessment of the hydration status related to the integumentary assessment. To avoid false positive findings of tenting, be sure to test skin turgor over the chest or the forehead of the adult and you could use the forehead or the abdomen of the infant. Age-related changes that are normal that you'll find while you're doing your assessment include decreased skin integrity or strength, an increased risk for impaired skin integrity, delayed wound healing, they have a decreased melanocyte production and an increased risk for sunburn and skin cancers. There's hyperplasia of melanocyte activity in sun exposed areas. And this gives us liver spots or age spots, like little changes in pigmentations. 
there's decreased dermal blood flow, hair follicles, and sebum production decrease. So dry skin and hair thinning are normal. In the upper left, we see the aging skin, loss of elasticity, wrinkles developing, increased facial hair growth in postmenopausal women is normal. In the upper middle, we see some sunburn and increased risk that, that you know, that risk increases with age. In the upper right, we see the senile latines, the liver spots, which are those benign pigment changes that occur with age. And in the bottom left, we have cherry hemangiomas from growth and dilation of the capillaries. Description of skin lesions includes the location, the shape, the color, the border characteristics, the distribution of the lesions and the arrangement, the moisture status, any drainage, the mobility, like if it's a nodule, if, is it fixed in place or is it mobile, and the temperature of the lesion. Be familiar with the terms that we use to clarify the properties of a lesion so that you can document them accurately. Primary lesions are things like macules, which are flat, like freckles, flat moles, uh, rubella even, and small, so they're less than one centimeter in diameter, versus a papule is raised, like a wart or an elevated mole, but still small, less than one centimeter. Patches are flat and large, and these would be things like vitiligo or cafe au lait spots. So they're like large macules. So a macule is smaller than a centimeter and a patch is larger than a centimeter, but they're both flat. A nodule is raised and large. So that's like a lipoma where you can palpate it, but it's greater than a centimeter in diameter. Cysts are nodules that are filled with liquid or semi-solid material that can be expressed like a sebaceous cyst. Plaques are raised and large. So like psoriasis, seborrheic keratosis, greater than a centimeter in diameter. Vesicles or blisters are raised and small. These are things like acute dermatitis or herpes zoster. Bullae are raised and large, and those would be burns or blisters greater than a centimeter in diameter. A wheel is raised and irregularly shaped, and those would be things like urticaria, so like hives from an allergic reaction, or insect bites. Erosions are typically associated with the later stages of like the vesicles and the bulla and the pustules, and um, they tend to be wide but superficial. Um, and we see those as basically like the wound base from some of those other lesions like varicella. Our secondary lesions, we have things like our scales, which are thickened, dry, white areas that we see with like psoriasis that often are associated at the same time with like plaques or papules. And then we have ulcers, which are deep erosions that extend beneath the epidermis, like a stage three pressure injury. And the reason that we've gotten away from saying pressure ulcer is because an ulcer is something that's deep and we have stage one pressure injuries where the skin is still intact in stage two, where we, you know, it's very superficial um, loss. And so it really is not technically accurate to say it's a pressure ulcer. A crust with oozing is dried serum or pus on the surface of the skin, which is usually the result of broken vesicles, bulla, or pustules that we see with things like eczema or empatigo. So they're weeping and then it kind of dries out and crusts over. Lichenifications are thickened areas caused by chronic itching or rubbing, like chronic dermatitis. 
and fissures are cracks in the epidermis that may extend into the dermis like athlete's foot, which is tinea. We also see atrophy, which is a thinning of the skin surface. And we see this with aging, but also with things like stretch marks. Diagnostic assessment of different skin conditions includes obtaining cultures, taking biopsies, using different light sources for examination, and um, KOH prep uh, also will help us do like a quick differentiation um, for things like a yeast infection while we're waiting for cultures to return. To obtain a swab culture of like a pustule or a vesicle, express the pus or the fluid from the pustule or the vesicle and collect it with a sterile cotton tipped applicator. Place it in the bacterial cultural medium. If the lesion is intact, it may need to be like unroofed to open it. Um, and uh, depending on you know where you work or um, your ability to practice in that environment, uh, you know, this may be a higher level like an NP or, or PA or physician type of thing, but they could take like a sterile needle or even a scalpel and open um, a lesion in order to culture it. For crusts, we want to remove those with normal saline and gauze to remove that outer layer where contamination could have dried onto the crust. And then you want to swab the wound bed of the lesion or the base of the lesion with kind of like the fresh um, serum or pus that's draining. And you can also remove an intact pustule for lab analysis. So they could actually remove an entire pustule and send it uh, to the lab. Punch biopsies are these little kind of circular um, biopsies that kind of take a, a divot out of the skin. Um, it looks very much like a whole punch when it's done. Uh, we use a local anesthetic for that. And uh, sometimes we just let that heal um, on its own and, and sometimes uh, they close it. So they may close it with a stitch or two a local anesthetic may contain epinephrine to keep the lidocaine in the local tissues. So when you're preparing for the provider to do these biopsies, if they ask for lidocaine or xylocaine with epinephrine, um, that is because the epinephrine is vasoconstricting and will hold the lidocaine in place where they injected it rather than the lidocaine dispersing out. So when you have something like a scalp that's highly vascular, um, if you just injected lidocaine in there, you might not have a great effect of numbing because it would spread. We don't use though anesthetic with epinephrine uh, for like wounds or injuries in places like fingertips or places where there's just like a small amount of capillary uh, perfusion, like noses and ears, where the epinephrine could actually decrease blood flow to the point of um, having an injury to the tissue. So we only use the epinephrine in places where there's adequate blood flow and the provider makes the decision. Just make sure you grab the right anesthetic. Shave biopsies. Um, are shallow and those just involve taking a scalpel and taking off um, you know the top or uh, kind of a, a little crater of um, typically things like moles or um, actinic keratosis things like that just to send to the lab for analysis and then those are things for like you know low risk lesions if they do come back positive for anything then they would go back in they would do an excisional biopsy so the excisional biopsy involves taking out more tissue um, and they cut and make sure that they have a clean margin all around the lesion that they're removing. 
After the biopsy, we want to teach the patient to leave the dressing in place for about eight hours, and then they'll do dressing changes daily until granulation tissue is seen. Uh, showering is typically okay after about eight hours, but no baths or swimming until it's healed. And typically those sutures are removed somewhere in the seven to 10 day range. But after about 24 hours, enough healing has occurred um, that you know technically the skin is kind of like waterproof again. Infection control is really important, especially with um, highly contagious viral lesions. So make sure that you're using the appropriate precautions while you're obtaining these specimens. An excision of a mass may be needed following the biopsy, as I mentioned for cancerous lesions. Um, so the mass plus the portion of the healthy tissue around the mass is removed, and the sample is sent to the lab to ensure that the borders were cleanly excised. And if that is done in some place like the operating room, they'll keep the person anesthetized and in the operating room until the pathologist says that all of the margins are clean, and then they can close the person back up again. Here we see the Woods light examination, and you can see that the Woods light is a black light, and different skin uh, conditions will fluoresce or turn different colors underneath this black light. So tinea, for example, turns like a kind of a green color. Bacterial skin infections can be uncomplicated which are usually kind of our normal flora that respond to antibiotic therapy alone, or even just surgical drainage with or without antibiotic therapy. So this may be like a sebaceous cyst or a pilonidal cyst or something like that, that they just open and drain and it heals all on its own. Complicated bacterial skin infections are when you have invasion of deeper tissues that requires debridement and um, it's more difficult to treat. So it might be a more complicated infection or it just might uh, be like a more virulent uh, microbe. Skin and soft tissue infections are categorized by the depth of the infection, the tissue that is involved, and the interventions necessary to resolve the infection. So the uncomplicated infections are usually related to normal body flora like Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes. And these uncomplicated skin infections, again, respond to antibiotic therapy alone and surgical drainage with or without antibiotic therapy. Keep in mind that MRSA, which is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, um, infections, they require different antibiotics, but can be uncomplicated or complicated, depending on the level of invasion of the tissues. We have both community acquired MRSA and healthcare acquired MRSA, and these are common skin infections. They cause a wide range of problems from folliculitis to extensive furuncles. So let's look at some of these infections. Our clinical presentation of a skin infection um, is kind of that typical, stereotypical presentation that you've learned about. Localized pain, redness, so erythema, warmth, it's hot to the touch because of the vasodilation and the infectious and inflammatory process that's occurring. And then there's edema. And, you know, again, that is from the localized vasodilation to allow the immune system to um, enter that area. Folliculitis, seen here on the upper right, is a superficial infection that involves the hair follicle, usually caused by staph or even MRSA. It's characterized by pustules where the hair exits the skin, typically on places like the buttocks, the beard, the thighs, or the scalp. Things like shaving, hair treatments like dyes or perms, chemicals, waxing, scratching, rubbing, or even friction can cause the onset of folliculitis. We treat it as if it is MRSA because that is becoming more and more common, especially for healthcare providers. 
with medications like doxycycline, Bactrim DS, or Cipro. A furuncle, or a boil, is also caused by staph, but it's deeper in the skin or the follicle, as seen here on the upper left. It may or may not have a head, like a little pustule on it. It presents as a red raised bump and is often very painful. People often mistake these for insect bites. They're most often found in warm, damp areas on the body and hairy skin folds, like the groin, the armpit, as well as the buttocks, the thighs, the abdomen, and the back of the neck. If left untreated, these can actually progress to cellulitis. Warm compresses can help with comfort. These are often IND, so um, incision and drainage, and um, they may or may not be packed depending on the depth of them. And then oftentimes, again, we give the same antibiotics to treat for MRSA just in case. So doxycycline, Bactrim DS, Cipro, meds like that are used frequently for these types of skin infections. Keflex, cephalosporin, those types of, of drugs as well. Cellulitis is a deeper infection of the dermis, um, often from strep or staph, and it can involve the underlying connective tissue. The affected area is very red and warm. It's swollen, so it's edematous and painful. And there may be blisters with or without weeping present. The lymph nodes are also often swollen and you want to kind of assess the nodes in the area that that, or, you know, in the direction that the area would be draining into. Um, so we see this frequently on the legs, areas with edema, ulcerations, wounds, and trauma. Again, warm compresses can help with comfort. Teach the patient about taking all of their antibiotics and monitoring for any increasing problems. And certainly cellulitis of the face is concerning to us because of the eye, all of those nerves that lead to the brain, and then, you know, obviously the airway if it should get any worse, um, or even meningitis. Empatigo is also a bacterial infection. It can be caused by staph or a group A beta hemolytic strep. These bullae form um, and then they kind of are very thin roofed um, and they're, they contain this kind of like um, clear yellow, almost honey colored uh, serous liquid on the inside. So in infants, the bullae that they see are usually staph, and then the non-bullous form is often seen in like children and young adults. Newborns are highly susceptible to an empatigo uh, infection because their resistance to skin bacteria is so low. So if an older child in the house had this, it would be super important to recognize it and treat it to avoid this cute little kid here kissing a younger sibling who was just born and giving them a nasty bacterial infection that they can't fight off. So really the harm, hallmark of these are these kind of thin roofed vesicles um, with these honey colored crusts, and yellow drainage. And again, this is very contagious. Treatment is either with oral or parenteral antibiotics. And uh, Bactroban, which is mupiracin, is a topical ointment, like a very strong bacitracin kind of ointment that we typically use for um, these type of infections, just in case they are MRSA. Um, and in order to not overload the community with uh, mupiracin, Bactroban, for non-MRSA uh, skin infections, we tend to be selective about prescribing that for things other than like empatigo or known MRSA. 
if that makes sense, because we don't want to create resistance in a population who had a splinter or a scrape or a, you know, cut on their finger and who would have been fine with bacteria, like just regular bacitracin or uh, neosporin. So moving away from the bacterial infections, let's talk about some of these viral infections that impact the skin. The most common viral infection of the skin are herpes virus infections. And until recently, we considered HSV-1 to be found on the face and HSV-2 to be found in the genitalia, like peri area. However, um, either can be found in either area. So you can have HSV-1 anywhere on the body that there's been an outbreak, and you can have HSV-2 anywhere on the body that there has been an outbreak. So the herpes simplex virus is a chronic infection with recurrent outbreaks. So it's kind of characterized by these exacerbations and remissions. Patients who are immunocompromised are at high risk for developing significant outbreaks and concurrent bacterial infections in open skin areas. So because they cause these like lesions that open, especially in immunocompromised patients, that creates a portal of entry then for a secondary infection. These are lifelong viral infections. There is no cure, but putting them on an antiviral medication such as acyclovir or val acyclovir can be both suppressive therapy to help decrease the frequency of outbreaks and abortive therapy to decrease the severity and a duration of an outbreak. So these um, sores tend to uh, show up on the skin, the mucous membranes, um, even in the central nervous system and the genital tracts. They are very painful lesions um, and people often report a tingling or a burning sensation prior to the actual outbreak. Since the virus itself is dormant along the nerve track or kind of hides in an, on a nerve track, it tends to then it breaks out on that same nerve track. So it usually recurs in the same areas over and over. The lesions themselves we would describe as a vesicle with a red base and those evolve then to pustules that rupture and weep and then crust over. The base becomes an erosion once it's opened. So again, it's really important to learn those words because then when you're describing what you're seeing, you can kind of figure out where you are in the life cycle of that lesion. Active HSV is a major concern um, to us uh, during pregnancy because the virus can be transmitted during labor and birth. No vaginal exams are done during times of active outbreaks and the HSV infection of the newborn can cause death or severe neurological deficits. Uh, we would collect a sample of the fluid within the lesion and send it to the lab for um, virologic and serologic testing. So it would tell us, yes, this is HSV, and then it would tell us typing. Is it type 1 or type 2? And um, then, you know, we would treat it uh, with the antiviral drugs. So the complications of HSV are uh, effective quality of life due to the psychosocial stress. And, you know, this person um, who has this then, you know, should tell every single person that they are with that they have this virus. And I'm not talking about somebody who gets a cold sore a couple times a year. I'm talking about somebody who has, you know, a significant, especially HSV2, but somebody who has a significant um, herpes simplex virus infection and or recurrent outbreaks. Um, it becomes a problem during pregnancy, and if it gets into the central nervous system, can cause encephalopathy and meningitis. Whitlow is the word that we use when we're talking about an infection of the fingertip or the hands, and herpetic whitlow 
uh, means an infection of the fingertip or hands with the herpes virus. HSV can infect your fingertips. So as a healthcare provider, you really need to be aware of this. Sometimes I think we try to be um, too reassuring and too friendly and we don't wear gloves because we don't want people to feel like we think that they are dirty. Um, so one of the things that you have to be very aware of is that your fingers can become infected with HSV and it can be easily spread from person to person. And in immunocompromised patients, it can cause severe pain and ulcerations. So what you see here is a kind of over um, uh, immunocompromised patient uh, who's having this massive uh, herpetic lesion related to the body's inability to fight it off at all. Um, so as healthcare providers, it's really critical that hand hygiene and gloves be used when caring for not only infected patients, but at risk patients. So anybody that you're concerned about, you should always protect them from you as well. And then kind of the last herpes virus is herpes zoster, which is shingles. And this is a kind of a holdover from the chickenpox uh, illness. So herpes zoster is found in patients who have had chickenpox, which was called varicella zoster. The virus again lies dormant or hides on the nerve tracts. Very specifically, it is on the dorsal root ganglia of the sensory nerves and it becomes active or reactivated during times of stress or immunosuppression. So we see it most often in the elderly and the immunocompromised. So people who have cancer, HIV, who are on chronic steroids or who have autoimmune disorders. It usually begins with a sensation of tingling or burning along the nerve tract for a few days. They may also experience itching and then that's followed by an eruption of lesions, which lasts for several weeks. Fever and malaise are also very common. The patients have these fluid filled vesicles, which can rupture and weep. As they resolve, they become crusted over and dry. Patients may experience post herpetic neuralgia, which is nerve pain from herpes irritation long after those lesions resolve. Herpes zoster is contagious to anyone who has not had chickenpox or successful vaccination. Patients should be isolated until the crusts are dry. Vaccination for shingles is recommended for adults over the age of 50, but this is a live vaccine and it cannot be given to anyone who has severe immunocompromise. Pain management and medication therapy are the priority for teaching and planning in the patient with herpes zoster. So this typically follows a single nerve tract. Now in people who are severely immunocompromised, we might see what we call disseminated herpes zoster or disseminated shingles, where it hits like multiple nerve tracts or it goes bilaterally or it goes all over the body, right? But that's rare. So the typical classic presentation of herpes is it's unilateral, it's one side of the body and it's a single nerve tract or sometimes two, like right next to each other. No pregnant caregivers because that baby, the developing fetus has not been protected. And the patient should be on contact precautions while there are any active vesicles. Okay, so now we've done bacterial and viral. Let's talk about some fungal infections. There's two types of fungal infections that are common in humans. They are caused by dermatophytes, which are artinia infections, and yeasts, which are our candidiasis infections. Dermatophytosis, which are fungal infections of the human skin, are annular, which means in a ring shape, or patches with an elevated border, scaling, and central clearing. Itching is very common with fungal infections, and these can occur anywhere on the body. Tinea versicolor, seen here in the upper right, is also called pityriasis, 
and this is a fungal tinea infection that causes small, pale, discolored patches on the skin. Tinea capitis occurs on the scalp. Tinea corporis occurs on the body. Tinea cruris occurs in the groin, or we affectionately refer to as jock itch. And tinea pedis occurs on the feet, which we refer to as athlete's foot. So tinea corporis, often referred to as ringworm, is a fungus, not a worm, and it has the classic annular shape with central clearing. The dermatophytes can be spread by direct contact with infected people, animals, and inanimate objects. It's highly contagious, so we recommend that you don't share towels, clothes, sheets, anything like that with somebody who has ringworm. Tinea is developing resistance to common over-the-counter medications, and so often we're having to do combination therapy now to treat it. It is, though, um, highly sensitive to UV light, so getting out into the sunshine and keeping it warm and dry and exposed to sun is one of the best ways to uh, treat the fungus. Candida albicans is a yeast infection of the skin and the mucous membranes. It is a common infection found also in warm, moist areas, especially in patients who are immunosuppressed on antibiotics, have hyperglycemia, or who are obese. The skin presents with a moist, red, irritated appearance that may also have a white or yellow, cheesy, yeast-smelling discharge. The most common areas to see candida are the perineum, the vagina, the axilla, under the breasts, and in the mouth, which is called oral thrush, and in any skin folds, like the panis. Intertrigo is the term used for chafing or skin irritation. Candida should always be treated because invasive yeast infections can be overwhelming to the immune system of somebody who is already immunocompromised. And we want to really educate the patient about the recognition, management, and prevention of candida or yeast infections and keeping that skin clean and dry and applying the medication appropriately um, and using antifungal or anti-yeast is uh, really important. So now let's talk about some of the common skin diseases that we see. Psoriasis um, really has an unknown etiology and no cure. Patients do better in warmer climates and UV radiation kills the rapidly proliferating skin cells. We do know that this is an autoimmune disorder that causes chronic inflammation of the skin and causes these lesions which are thick raised red patches with silvery flaking scales. You can kind of see they're very distinct um, circumscribed thick reddened papules or plaques with silvery scaling flakes. Um, it can also cause psoriatic arthritis which is where kind of the autoimmune system starts to attack the joints. So psoriasis itself is not typically painful, but psoriatic arthritis is. Our goal of treatment for psoriasis is to reduce the symptoms and control the disease and improve the quality of life. We usually use steroids, topical steroids, so you want to teach the patient about the topical application of steroids. You can use warm, moist dressings and a plastic wrap over the ointment to enhance absorption if it's prescribed by the physician. So much like soaking in a tub or whatever, it softens the plaques or it softens the skin. So using warmth and moisture and that plastic wrap to kind of trap that warmth and moisture in sometimes will help enhance absorption. Many drugs used to treat psoriasis, aside from the steroids, are either teratogenic, so they can't be used in pregnant patients because they cause birth defects, 
or they're linked to the development of certain cancers like lymphomas. So many of our patients who have psoriasis kind of weigh the risks and the benefits and try to go with like a more naturopathic process for dealing with um, their skin issues. Complications include infection of open areas, and we know that the steroids that we're using to treat the issue enhance the risk of infection, which can be very frustrating for patients. The side effect of medications as well. So again, you know, not only uh, if they're taking like, you know, systemic steroids or oral steroids, then you have the hyperglycemia, you have the weight gain, you know, you have the increased risk of infection, you have the immunosuppression, uh, but then the, the, the risk of malignancy is there. Um, and overall, you know, significantly poorly controlled psoriasis can definitely change uh, someone's quality of life and their self image. There are nail conditions that are associated with psoriasis. As you see here, we have spoon nails, which are called coilonicheas, and then pitting also is common with psoriasis. So moving away from that, let's talk about skin integrity. We'll start with trauma. Skin trauma is a result of external energy being applied to the skin. So the trauma is classified as an acute wound. Uh, we talk about things like lacerations and abrasions, excoriation, friction blisters, skin tears, and avulsions. And all of these lead to um, impaired skin integrity or an opening in the skin tissue that then prohibits the skin from being able to do its job as far as protection and even temperature regulation if you have a significant injury. There are four phases of wound healing. Hemostasis is immediate, so there um, is vasoconstriction, and then platelets and uh, clotting factors are activated. Fibrin uh, deposits then occur at the site and collagen plugs form. So just like you know, fixing endo, um, endothelial or endovascular injury, we have the same kind of a process that occurs here for um, integumentary trauma. In the inflammatory phase, between 24 hours to two weeks, there is capillary leak where, remember those mast cells release things like heparin and histamine and boy, a whole actual host of um, chemicals, but uh, that causes your capillary um, beds to dilate and allow your white blood cells to be able to exit the vasculature and get into those third spaces, right, which is the interstitial space. So now your white blood cells, the macrophages, can get into the area where the injury is. But with it comes, you know, protein and uh, sometimes red blood cells and uh, fluid, lots of lots of fluid. So we have plasma, we have heparin, we have histamine. Um, and so we have edema and we have warmth because we have increased flow. Uh, and then we also have this phagocytosis from the macrophages that are killing the bacteria or any foreign bodies or any infection that's there. And that causes the pus or the exudate that we see as well. Um, macrophages also secrete growth factor and cytokines um, that activate collagen synthesis to help the skin start to lay down an extracellular matrix. So at this point in time, we start to get a stimulation of uh, granulation tissue or new growth. In the proliferative phase, there is angiogenesis, which is the creation of new blood vessels, epithelialization, which is the creation of a new epithelial layer, and then fibroplasia and granulation tissue. So we're healing and everything's growing together. And then collagen deposition and wound contraction. So what happens when we have a wound as it's healing is um, kind of like, uh, 
somebody was knitting something kind of loosely and then at the end they kind of tugged on that string and pulled all those fibers together and that's kind of what happens um, you know at the end of the proliferative phase as we start to see wound contraction or we start to see a shortening of those fibers that were used for healing and then the same thing occurs for up to two years during the maturation phase where there's a decreased fluid within the wound decreased metabolic rate at the site reorganization of the collagen fibers and the scar tissue tends to be tight and that area actually tends to be very tense and very strong as far as management of skin trauma goes um, you want to get a history of the wound the injury itself as well as their medical history we definitely want to know their immunization status specifically the tetanus shot um, want to talk about you know adequate fluid and protein and nutrients and vitamins so that they can heal thinking about their um, immune status so are they immunocompromised and then we as providers but also they as patients need to be able to identify infections so you want to make sure that you're teaching as well as watching and then control or eliminate any external factors that could cause problems some wounds need to be closed or some wounds we create and then we have to take care of so we talk about three ways that wounds can be closed uh, primary secondary and tertiary intention primary intention occurs when we have a clean wound where immediate closure is possible and this comes from a surgical incision or a very sharp clean laceration um, so this would be somebody who had you know surgery and the wound was very clean and the edges easily approximate and we you know staple them or suture them back together or you're cooking and you slice your finger and you go into the hospital and they clean it out and they suture it and close it back together so nice clean sharp uh, wound with good wound edge approximation would get a primary intention closure Secondary intention is where the wound has to be left open, either partially or entirely, with tissue loss and jagged edges, and you're unable to close it. Um, it closes by granulation and filling, so kind of closes from the wound base out, rather than pulling the edges together and having the edges heal themselves, um, like, you know, seal themselves back up again. And we see this not only with pressure injuries, but also with uh, bites and gouges and severe lacerations, open fractures, sometimes things like that. Tertiary intention is when we have a contaminated wound or an infected surgical site and we leave it open so that we can clean it or debride it and then we close it later um, in about four to six days. And that helps reduce the scarring you know by closing it later on but we leave it open so that we can um, evacuate or reduce some of that infection and um, you know we see this probably most frequently with things like abdominal um, uh, problems so you know a ruptured gallbladder a ruptured appendix a ruptured diverticulum um, surgeries where they went in and they kind of cleaned the person out but they couldn't fully close them because you know they needed some of that to still drain out and so then they will go back in a couple days and they'll close that up later on complications then of skin trauma well since the skin is our protective layer the major complication of trauma to the skin then would be infection the signs and symptoms of infection include foul smelling discharge purulent drainage edema and erythema around the wound from that uh, immune response pain and a fever and this is all that immune and inflammatory response that occurs when your body recognizes invasion from a foreign microbe So another type of skin um, injury that we see frequently in healthcare are pressure injuries. And these could be related to positioning and they could be related to medical devices. 
These are most common among physically limited or bedridden people or people who have like a decrease in sensorineural uh, capability. We see these mostly in individuals over the age of 65 and they definitely increase the risk of mortality in older adults and in patients who are in intensive care. So people who have a decreased immune system or who are critically ill have an increased risk of like sepsis from a pressure injury. So what happens, typically we see these over the bony prominence, but basically, uh, you know, there's a maximum time frame that your tissue can go without blood flow. And so depending on the firmness of the um, surface that you're on, and how much subcutaneous tissue you have, which remember decreases with aging, so the older you are, the greater at risk you are, your bony prominences or the ridges or edges or kind of sharper points of your bones then kind of press up against the surface that you're on. And over time, they compress um, kind of downward or with gravity and exceed the pressure in the capillary beds, just like when you check cap refill, but it would be like somebody was sustaining that pressure for a very long time. And so these can develop in as little as like 15 minutes or so in somebody who has poor perfusion or um, who is already kind of at risk for impaired skin integrity, poor, who has poor nutrition, um, you know, has frail skin, lack of subcutaneous tissue anyway. So that pressure injury occurs because we exceed capillary pressure in that area long enough for the tissue to become ischemic and then that tissue infarcts and then it becomes necrotic and it opens. It can be directly from pressure or it can also be from pressure in combination with shear, which is, you know, like people sliding down or uh, moving. And then we also see, you know, friction as a cause. It's important for us to stage pressure injuries to have an idea of like what happened and why, but also to keep an eye on things to make sure that they're not getting worse. The first, and these are not in order of best to worst, but the first level would be a deep tissue injury or a DTI. Suspected deep tissue injury occurs when the um, skin is intact but appears purple or maroon and there might be blood filled blisters. It's very painful and there's a change in the tissue density. So it may be firmer or it may be mushier depending on how much blood is in that hematoma or like kind of like that pocket that was created. Um, the temperature also is different than the surrounding tissue. And again, it might be cool or it might be warm. And that also depends on whether or not there's um, how much blood flow is, is there is in that area. We see these a lot with <clears throat> significant falls where people who have been on a hard surface for a significant period of time. So these may open and become three or four, uh, but at this point in time, it's a suspected deep tissue injury because, you know, it would take a CAT scan or something to see the extent of uh, damage that was actually done. So at risk is uh, when you have bony prominences or areas impacted by medical devices that are reddened, but are blanchable. And this is kind of before the development of a stage one pressure injury. And we should recognize these early on and then take measures to avoid development of a stage one pressure injury. During stage one, the skin is intact. The area typically remains over those bony prominences or under a medical device or against a hard surface. And the skin is red and intact, but it does not blanch anymore. With the stage two, there's a partial thickness loss of the epidermis or the dermis. With the stage three, there's a full thickness skin loss and you can see the underlying tissues. So we've made it now down through the dermis. And then stage four, there's exposed muscle, tendon, or bone. 
Um, there's also what we refer to as unstageable. And that is when the wound base is covered with slough or eschar that you can't remove by just cleaning or debriding like you normally would. And in that instance, the physician typically would have to do a surgical debridement to see the extent of the wound. Now, if my patient had a stage three and it was healing, and now it was only partial thickness, it is still a stage three that is healing. So once you have been diagnosed with a stage three, it's always a stage three, even once it's you know healed, um, it, it doesn't go from a stage three to a stage two to a stage one. But if I have a stage two and it gets worse, it does become a stage three. So you can progress and become worse, but you never you know, get downgraded basically in, our, in your staging. Risk factors for developing pressure injuries then are, again, having an increased age over 65 because of that lack of subcutaneous tissue, having decreased functional status and decreased mobility because you don't reposition yourself as much, you don't have the strength, maybe you don't have like the neural processing to understand that you know, your bum is tired and it needs to be shifted or that your foot is up against something hard and it needs to be moved. Steroid use increases the risk as well as other comorbidities. Um, things that increase edema um, also will increase our risk. Impaired blood flow, cognitive impairment, urinary and fecal incontinence, can dramatically increase the risk because they irritate the skin. They can change the pH of the skin and cause breakdown. History of previous pressure injuries and terminal illness all increase the risk of developing a new pressure injury or worsening pressure injury. And then, you know, medical devices, nasal cannulas, Foley catheters, splints, traction, you, know, you name it. Management of pressure injury is really important to do supporting surfaces, um, you know, uh, pressure reduction, adequate nutrition, proper wound care, debriding of the wounds, and managing comorbidities as much as possible. Complications, we said infection is the big one. Right. So infection is the main complication of pressure injuries. So it's really important that you're doing the dressing changes as prescribed. You really want to debride that wound base while you're in there doing that dressing change. And remember that when you do a good debridement um, at, you know, during the dressing change and you get that little capillary bleeding, that stimulates the growth factors that helps fill in that granulation tissue. So you really want to clean out all of, you know, the slough or anything that's in there to really get a nice healthy pink wound bed so that it can heal uh, well and faster on its own. Okay, so uh, skin cancer. Actinic keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. Actinic keratosis is not actually a cancer. It is a precancerous lesion um, and without treatment can evolve into a squamous cell carcinoma. So these are just overgrowths of um, keratotic uh, skin patches that then if left untreated uh, tend to turn into squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma are atypical squamous cells that invade into the dermis and can metastasize within a few months. So we want to be sure that we're keeping an eye on uh, those changing uh, actinic keratoses as well as looking for, um, you know, the kind of strange brown lesions. Um, and then basal cell. So basal cell carcinoma rarely metastasize uh, and can cause significant tissue damage due to large excisions, but also can be treated like with creams and stuff. Um, so these all are typically found on areas of skin exposure. 
So, you know, the head and the, the face, arms, the chest, but places where um, if or the back even, depending on, you know, male or female uh, and what you wore outside. But areas that were had significant sun exposure are higher risk for actinic keratosis, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma. Malignant melanoma is the most serious of all skin cancers, and um, that is the one that carries a, a very um, high mortality rate. The uh, average lifespan is less than a year from the time of diagnosis. So this is the reason why we developed the ABCDE uh, skin lesion screening, because malignant melanoma really typically falls under that ABCDE um, kind of uh, explanation. So when we're looking at these kind of skin lesions on people, our actinic keratosis is um, typically like yellow or, or brown. The squamous cell carcinoma kind of follows that, um, but then oftentimes has like this ulceration in the center of that. So it looks kind of like angry or irritated. And basal cell carcinoma is almost like flesh colored. They refer to it as being like pearly. Um, and then it has like a rolled kind of waxy border with like a central crater. Melanoma, however, is um, what they refer to as like variegated colors, red, white, and blue tones. So kind of this uh, irregular colors that run through. And so when we talk about like color consistency, if you have like changing colors or inconsistent colors, that's concerning for melanoma. So the A, B, C, D, E of skin assessment. So these, again, these are the things that concern us about, specifically about melanoma, but about all skin lesions. Um, so asymmetric appearance, a normal skin lesion. Let's just talk about a mole. A normal mole would have a symmetrical appearance. It would be round. So an asymmetrical mole would get our interest up. Irregular borders. So typically a normal skin lesion has regularly shaped borders that are clearly demarcated. You can tell them um, distinctly from the surrounding tissue and a melanoma does not. It has irregular borders that sometimes are difficult to distinguish, but rather than being, you know, nice and round like a pencil eraser, um, it has this asymmetrical shape and irregular borders. There's a variation of color, so brown, black, tan, red, white, combination, um, you know, a, a normal mole is brown and, you know, may have a slight variation of a different shade of brown in there, but, you know, it stays pretty much a single color. Um, the diameter greater than six millimeters is conveniently a standard pencil eraser. So if, um, you know, you have a lesion that's larger than a pencil eraser, that's concerning. And then any elevation or an evolving, enlarging, or changing existing lesion should be looked at. And we recommend people, especially people who have fair skin or people who have a family history or people who are high risk for melanoma or other skin cancers um, to get checked annually uh, by um, a dermatologist or at least their primary care provider so that uh, these could get recognized early on. When patients have invasive or extensive skin cancer, um, surgery oftentimes needs to be done. So there can be surgical ex excision, uh, curatage and electro desiccation. Um, cryotherapy is when we kind of freeze things off versus um, radiotherapy. Uh, so, you know, radiation and then topical chemotherapy. Um, again, with surgical management for malignant melanoma, the treatment is excision, uh, so an excisional biopsy, but excision with at least a five millimeter margin of unaffected tissue um, in every direction 
and then they want to remove the nearest lymph node. So they consider that the sentinel node, lymph node biopsy um, to make sure that uh, it hasn't spread that far. A malignant melanoma is considered incurable and the median survival rate is 7.5 months following diagnosis. Um, there's a lot of physical complications of the treatments themselves. So the surgery, the cryotherapy, the radiotherapy, the chemotherapy, all of that has a lot of uh, physical complications like fatigue and infection, immunocompromise, um, pain. But then there's also these psychosocial aspects uh, like this gentleman here who has obviously um, some clear deformities that could impair his self-image. Reconstructive surgery is available for certain patients. About 5 million reconstructive surgeries are performed each year. There's two major groups of patients who require reconstructive surgery. Um, so typically people who uh, have like congenital defects or disfiguring birthmarks, and then people who need repair from things like trauma, tumor excisions, infections, or chronic wounds. A plastic surgeon closes the wound with minimal scarring or, you know, like reconstructs the area and then um, closes it and hopefully has minimal scarring. And then, uh, you know, the, the medical and nursing management on this is carefully monitoring lab values, making sure that there's no evidence of infection. Um, antibiotics are usually ordered prophylactically for treatment and then nutrition must be optimized for healing to occur. So, you know, remember again, we're looking at things like hydration, protein, vitamins, like really wanting to optimize that patient's nutrition to make sure that they have the right building blocks on board for uh, skin healing and wound healing. And complications of surgery are just like the complications of any other open skin problem and really it's infection is the largest uh, complication or our largest concern. As always, thank you for watching. Um, I appreciate your time and I hope that this is helpful for you. Good luck with everything. I wish you the best.